So I had the privilege of visiting Victory Life Church in Durant, Oklahoma back in February of 2011. And I've told this story before, I, I went reluctantly. I, I was in a bad place. I was frustrated with ministry. I, I, frankly, I was frustrated with my relationship with God and I was ready to just kind of wash my hands of, of ministry. And some dear friends of mine had moved on there and they just could not say enough about Victory Life Church, they could not say enough about Pastor Dwayne. And they've been inviting me over and over. And, and finally, just to get them to stop, I came. And when we rolled up to, to uh, the Durant location that night, yeah, it's a beautiful campus. It's a, it's a big building, but I, I've seen beautiful campuses and I've seen big churches. So it wasn't all that impressive. We arrived, you know, kind of right up to the edge and we had to park pretty far back in the parking lot. No big deal other, uh, other than we had to make a little walk across the parking lot. Well, that's when I saw the, the golf cart running around. And this overly bubbly guy rolls around and says, hey guys, hop on, let's get a ride. And I'm thinking, no, save that for someone who struggles to walk or an elderly person. And so I, I tried to humbly say, no, we're good. And he's like, no, 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 this is what I'm here for. Let me give you a ride. And so I reluctantly get on and immediately he asked me, so where are you from? And I said, I just flew in from Michigan. Michigan, I, I can't believe you came this far. We're so blessed to have you. And 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 I'm like, like kind of taken back. And I, my mind's kind of going, is this gonna be one of those stories where I get inside and this is like the undercover boss, like he's gonna turn out to be the pastor or something, you know? So we we, we get up there and um, I just was so moved by the parking lot attendant that had such joy that prepared my heart that I wasn't ready to receive. And it never, it never left me. But I had uh, someone had snagged a picture of us on the golf cart. And all these years later, I, I remember Benny as the golf cart driver who, who his ministry in the parking lot literally started changing my heart. And I don't mean this in a way that just something good to say for recording, like Benny's fingerprints are all over this church because of the impact that he made on my life. So one of my dreams was always to be able to buy a golf cart because I wanted somebody like me to be served the moment that they got on our property. And so one of the things we did is we bought a six passenger golf cart and we named it Benny. In fact, we have his name uh, on, the, on the hood of our cart, Benny. And it's the start of our golf cart fleet, I say. So this Benny won, and so Benny two will come next. But it's a real honor to put his name on there because I want someone to ask, why did you name it Benny? So that we can speak to the value of the ministry of helps. It's before they ever hear a worship song, it's before they ever hear a pastor, what happens uh, in the impacting moments in the parking lot can literally change someone's life. Some of you, many of you have seen that video before. I've probably seen it somewhere in the neighborhood of 150 to 200 times and it's still, it still grips me each time. It sounds like I need to watch myself on TV. I don't, but I love the story. I love the story. Um, Look, today is uh, an interesting day. Um, I'm wearing a t-shirt, which is making me both uncomfortable and comfortable. And you might be wondering, you know, why, you know, why all these t-shirts, why they're all dressed alike? And yesterday, what we did is we wanted to celebrate all of our volunteers and just say thank you for all that you do. And we gave out shirts on purpose to wear today. And not everyone could attend yesterday. And so there are people who aren't wearing a t-shirt that could be, but we just didn't get one to them yesterday. And I wanted it to do it for two purposes. Number one, I wanted it to, to show how much it takes to pull off a weekend experience here at Believers by seeing all of these shirts. And also to um, point out that we only handed out about half of them where we have nearly 140 to 150 volunteers that make the weekend and our food pantry and all of the behind the scenes efforts happen. And tying into our final message today when it comes to the preparation series that we've been on. And today I wanna to talk about serving. And the reason we played the video again about the Vinny experience is because that was just the start of that trip. I got invited to attend a conference down in Durant, Oklahoma. And my experience was first starting off with, with Vincent, the, the, the golf cart driver. And when I got inside, I already knew some names and I've been listening to some of their messages. So I kind of knew them, they didn't know me. And I was introduced right off the bat to the associate pastor, the number two person in the organization. His name is Pastor Lee Armstrong. And 
being in ministry for as many years as I had been, I knew how busy somebody in his role was going to be that day because of all of the things going on. There were people like me who flew in from all over the nation to be there. And when he shook my hand and introduced himself to me, he said, do you have a few minutes? We can catch up. And so I, I'm kind of like, I know that he's busy, and yet he took me to a corner of the auditorium, and we sat down, and for the next 15 minutes, he just talked to me, and was asking me a story, and, and, and finally, when the, the countdown came on the screen, and he looked up and realized, he goes, well, I guess I, I should get to it and get back to um, well, what his next thing was, and then he said these words that changed my life. He said, while you're here, if there's anything I can do to serve you, just let me know. And I'd never heard somebody in such a significant role of leadership say those words to me. Serve me. Who am I to be served? I'm, uh, I'm looking up to you, but his heart was, I want to serve you. We're here to be a blessing to you. And I began to see from that day forward what it looked like to be a servant leader and ultimately what a healthy church filled with people who love Jesus that want to serve others looks like. And no matter how big you get or how populated the 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 weekends are, how many campuses they have. When you walk into a Victory Life location, it's like going into a believers on steroids, okay? And, and I mean that in a good way. Like, they showed me that it's possible to hold on to what makes us uniquely different or hold on to our DNA and still grow and, 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 and move forward. And so um, a couple weeks ago in our staff meeting, I made a statement that was an accidental epiphany. I, I was... I was Um, talking about the fact that, you know, there's a lot going on in our church. There's a lot going on in our future. This next six months, eight months are going to be incredibly impactful. But I was also alarmed and concerned about the pace and concerned about people helping to to carry that load and that burden. And, And out of my mouth shot, only you can prevent burnout. And I said, quick, write that down before we forget it. And so we had these shirts made, Only You Can Prevent Burnout, in which I want to talk to you about today, about the importance and the value that all of us make. It is not just about a worship team that sings great songs and leads us into worship. And it's certainly not just about the communicator on Sunday. Today, as we talk about serving, I want to submit to you that serving is God's plan for advancing his kingdom. It is God's plan for making influence in this life. And we're all called to make influence. So about a dozen years ago, or 10 years ago, actually, uh, an ambitious couple and a handful of individuals had a heart to make a difference in this world and to, and to serve God in a way that we thought was important. And so a Bible study started, which then led to planting this church. And we did so with three primary core values. And these three simple core values are what motivated us and continue to motivate us today. And I want to talk to you from these three points and and build upon them as we finalize this series. And they're simply this. The first core value that we have here at Believers is all people matter to God. Say all. All All people matter to God. A fully devoted life to Jesus is normal. And thirdly, excellence honors God. And so if we're going to look at these, these values, we have to derive where they come from. And Jesus is the one that we derive them from. And he's our model. He's our prototype. He shows us what's, what's possible. He shows us what's necessary. And so I just began to write down a few things about Jesus's life that, that he, he showed us that all people matter. Jesus touched the sick people, like the lepers, the people that no one would come near. Jesus spoke to people that culture told him that he wasn't supposed to, like the Samaritan woman. You see, in that era, the, a Samaritan was a, a Jew and a Greek. They were a mixed race. They were despised. They were looked down on. Not only would they not talk to a Samaritan, they would literally walk around their city and, as opposed to walking through it as a shortcut. Not only would they not talk to them, they certainly, a man of, that, of, of his stature, wouldn't have talked to a woman. And yet Jesus talked to the, the Samaritan woman at the well. Jesus ate with sinners like the tax collector and the mobsters, like Zacchaeus. Jesus, a rabbi, touched the unclean, like dead people and the woman with the issue of blood. You see, a rabbi wasn't allowed to come in proximity of somebody who was dead. They would be deemed unclean. He couldn't come in proximity with a, with a woman who was currently on her cycle because she would have been deemed unclean and he would have been made unclean, but that didn't stop Jesus. Jesus, all people mattered. Jesus called the disqualified to serve on his executive team, like Peter, the fisherman, and Matthew, the tax collector. And Jesus restored good people who did bad things, like Peter, who had denied him 
three different times. In psychology, they would call this the pyg- Pygmalion effect, but in the kingdom of God, we just call it the heart of the Father. I want to share with you this interesting um, experiment that I came across. One of the most well-known psychology experiments ever performed was done by a team of researchers led by Robert Rothenthal. The team went into an elementary school and administered intelligence tests to the students. The researchers then told the teachers in each of the classrooms which students, say Sam, Sally, or Sarah, the data had indicated as academic superstars, the ones with the greatest potential for growth. They asked the teachers not to mention the results of the study to the students and not to spend any more or any less time with them. And in fact, the teachers were warned they would be observed to make sure they did not. And at the end of the year, the students were tested again. And indeed, Sam, Sally, and Sarah posted off the chart intellectual ability. This would be a predictable story, except for the twist at the end. When Sam, Sally, and Sarah had been tested at the beginning of the experiment, they were found to be absolutely, wonderfully ordinary. The researchers had randomly picked their names and then lied to the teachers about their ability. But after the experiment, they had in fact turned into academic superstars. So what caused these ordinary students to become extraordinary? Although the teachers had said nothing directly to these children and had spent equal amounts of time with everyone, two crucial things happened. The belief the teachers had in the students' potential had been unwittingly and non-verbally communicated. More important, these non-verbal messages were then digested by the students and transformed into reality. The Pygmalion effect is defined as this. When your belief in another person's potential brings that potential to life. I believe that articulates the ministry of Jesus perfectly. And not only is it the ministry of Jesus, it's the ministry that he passed on to you and I. We have this great privilege to look into the individual and by our belief in them, which is generated from the belief that God has value and purpose in every one of us, we can help bring that into reality. It is believing the best best of others. It's connecting with them and serving them because all people matter. I think it's interesting that James would talk about faith that's nonverbal. James chapter two, verse number 14. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but you show it or, or you don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Let me just pause for a moment. You say it, you have words for it, but you don't have actions for it. Can that kind of faith actually save anyone? Can we rescue people from their despair? Can we rescue people from the patterns of their, of their past? Can we reach into the darkness and bring, bring them into his marvelous light? You can, but not just by believing. You can by your actions. The response of this great and precious belief. Verse number 16, suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing and you say goodbye and have a good day, stay warm, eat well, but then you don't give the person any food or clothing. What good does that do? So you see that faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it's dead and useless. Sometimes, especially here in America, we have pictures, portraits of Jesus even portraits and pictures of Jesus on the cross. And even on the cross, he's half smiling, kind of looks like California Jesus, you know, sweet tan, light hair. And he's there on this cross, you know, he's sort of covered. And I'm saying it with, 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 this in, with, with contempt on purpose because the scriptures don't tell us that Jesus looked handsome on the cross. In fact, if you read about the, the prophet's description, it says Jesus was beaten so bad that his face was unrecognizable, not only as himself, but as a human. And so it seems unreasonable to me that if we say we've got this faith of an amazing rescue or savior who put on flesh and blood, went through that kind of torturous death, that that's just something that I believe but doesn't impact how I live or that I would say or be settled on the fact that, oh, thank you, Jesus, for saving me, but doing nothing more with it seems so unreasonable. It seems so unthinkable that this amazing experience 
should produce within us the ability, the desire to serve others because all people matter. Bob Goff, one of my favorite authors and speakers, says this, for some people, it's easier to make plans than to make time. If this is you, here's how to fix it. Make love your plan. Make love your plan. And we've been talking about the disciplines that come with time. All of us can probably say that last week was busy. And guess what? Next week's going to be busy. Some of us, we can talk about it. We can say, we, we can come up with these great plans and these charts and these, these, these uh, you know, one, two, threes of what we're going to do. But I'm telling you, it takes a lot of effort and it takes a commitment to give time. But if we're motivated by love, well, then love becomes a plan of action. You see, when we started around the same time that first year, when I say started our church, I began to hear word of this church out in California. A church by the name of Bethel in Redding, California had, had decided that they wanted to just be more than a church in the community. They decided that they wanted to take responsibility, that they wanted to serve their community in such a way that they were going to influence them. And they coined this phrase with reckless generosity. And it finally, that phrase, those two words gave words to what I felt. Because I didn't want to just be another church that was in the community, another church that, that someone could drive by and say, there's a church there. I wanted to be ones that really took responsibility. And I heard stories about how uh, they would go out in, in the Starbucks, for example. They would pay for the person behind them so frequently that on one occasion, when someone pulled up and paid for the car behind them, it started a chain reaction that lasted for five hours hours. Nobody paid for their own coffee for five hours. They just kept paying for the one behind him and the one behind him. There's another story of a restaurant owner who came to the pastor and said, listen, pastor, we need you to stop having people from your church come to our restaurant. And the pastor was mortified. Oh my gosh, what are they doing? He says, what's happening? He says, nobody can pay for their own meal anymore. <laughs> Reckless generosity. And I began to think, this is it. This has to work. This is what Jesus did. This is what he modeled. And so we, our first year, we're excited to be in the community. We started in Eagle. And if you're from this region or this area, there's an event that happens every year that's super big. It's called Eagle Days. And we heard word. I mean, I knew about it, but I didn't know how significant it was to the immediate community. It brings thousands of people out to this event. And so in my ambition and in my excitement and in my even immaturity and maybe a little bit naive, I jumped in with this idea, hey, there's going to be thousands of people coming into Eagle. Let's, let's be a part of it. Let's, let's, let's make an event of it. We'll do inflatables and we'll, we'll do face painting. We'll, we'll give away food. Hey, how about this? We'll send out a postcard to everybody in the Eagle zip code and let them know when you come into Eagle, swing by believers. We're going to have a good time. We're going to feed you. What I didn't realize and what I didn't know was that was the biggest uh, fundraising event for the P Eagle Park Association that they do in order to cover the cost of their, their park and all the things that they do. And so when they received the postcard, it was insulting to them. I hadn't given that much thought. I didn't realize it wasn't my intent. It wasn't my heart to do that. But word got back and some people were upset. And another individual from our church had heard word that some, some you know, some names were called. Um, it was the first time that I know of that we were called a cult, which I thought, finally. Because um, <laughs> it kind of means you might be doing something. And so this, this sweet lady comes over to the office and she's crying. Pastor Phil, I can't believe how mad they are. And they called you a cult. And I just don't know what to do. And, and I said, okay, okay, let me, let me just think about it. Let me pray. And so I did. I paused for a moment. I prayed and I, I decided to write them a letter. And I told them that I'm, I'm sorry. We are sorry that we hadn't thought this through and that our intent was not to, to rob away from what they were doing. We wanted to be a blessing and it was in our ambition that we, it was an oversight. But not only do I offer you my apology, I gave them a check. And I said, please take this check to offset any of the profits that you might have lost by us giving away hot dogs. Two days later, not only did they not cash that check, not only did they receive our apology, but it was through that generous act that they partnered with us and began, and to this day, are partnered with us with our food pantry. And we continue to serve this community together. 
There were people, amen, give God a hand for that. There were people in that group and on that, that, that board that had a real bad taste for Christians because they were used to pastors and churches showing up in their community looking for the hand out, but we were coming to give out. We wanted to be there to be a blessing. And I can tell you that, and I'll boast on this, that I am really good friends with the majority of them today, and we are in good relationship because of, of generosity. And so discipline was something that we talked about last week, and we repainted this notion that discipline has to be a bad thing, that discipline is actually saying that you value the purpose that God has within your life. Discipline is an act of investment, or, or we could say it this way. Discipline requires us to invest today's actions for tomorrow's results. And a church of faith sees the future and seeds the future. You see, when when we say that we want to make an impact, it's more than just a declaration or our mission statement or our vision statement. No, a church of discipline invests today, serves today to help people or serve others in the future. And not only do we see where God wants us to go, we're going to, by faith, plant seed and we're going to contribute and we're going to serve because all people matter to God. In Mark chapter 10, Jesus is walking down the the beach and his ministry team is having a conversation and, and two of his key leaders, they start this conversation among themselves and they're like, you know what? I kind of like the idea that when Jesus ascends and he's sitting at this road, I'd like to sit on his right side. You can sit on his left. How about we approach him and talk to him about this? And they have no idea what they're asking, but they do. They, they come to Jesus and they talk to Jesus about sitting at the right and left hand uh, of him on the throne. And so he brings the team in together. In Mark chapter 12, verse number 42, Jesus gathered them all together and said to them, those recognized as rulers of the people and those who are top leadership positions rule oppressively over their subjects. But this is not the example you're to follow. You are to lead by a different model. If you want to be the greatest, then live as one called to serve others. The path to promotion comes by having the heart of a bond slave or a bond servant who serves everyone. For even the Son of Man did not come expecting to be served by everyone, but to serve everyone and to give his life as a ransom price for the salvation of many. Serving is the door that opens to influence. If you want to influence others, if you want to change the world, it's going to start by serving others. It's so uh, uh, contradictory to the style and the method of this world. Don't be surprised that when you first start serving people, they want to know what's the catch. What do you, what's, what's the sneak in later that you're trying to get? What if the message is that we just want to love because we've been loved? What if we actually lived by the fact that the gospel means good news, that news that's too good to be true? Theodore Roosevelt famously said, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. We can have all this amazing knowledge, great scriptural depths of revelation of who God is, but they won't hear a word of it until they're convinced that you actually care. Can I get an amen on that? So all people matter to God. Secondly, a fully devoted life to Jesus is normal. That was the original intent. Now we've gotten it uh, off and we've, we've skewed and we've battled from that, that line, but, or we've, we've, we've gotten off from that line, but the, the original intent was a fully devoted life to God. So let me ask you a question. Has Jesus become for some of us a Sunday morning hobby? Is Jesus someone that you pencil in or the one that you schedule your life around? I think there are some of us that we were and now we, we're trying to find our way back to the center of the road. There are others that we actually view this just as kind of a, a part of the week that we kind of check off. And I want to challenge that because serving God is not just like a priority list. Let me explain. Many of us are taught the hierarchy in life. We would say, probably all of us would agree, the fact that you're at church on Sunday morning, I'm thinking that we're at least on the same page, that that there is a God. And so we would say, God is number one, right? Just give me a head nod if you think God is number one over everything. Okay. 
So then we say, well, God first, then family, then ministry or work. Uh, I'll say ministry because whether you, you stand in front of a stamping press or you stand on a platform, we're all called to do ministry, just different venues. Amen. So God, family, ministry, work, and he goes on. The problem with that kind of model is it segregates us. It separates us and we're never called to be separated. What do you mean? Well, right now I've got my God hat on, right? He's, he's my focus. This is what I'm working on. But, but when I leave, I got to put on my, my, my dad hat, my husband hat. And, and now, you know, Monday comes and I got to put on my, my pastor hat or my, 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 my business hat or whatever that is. And, and then we constantly are changing what hat we're wearing. And the problem is, is we end up disconnecting from the one who provides the grace to do it all. What if, what if we viewed God as the center of a hub of a wheel? And from that hub, all the spokes are everything else that we do in this life. Now we've never left him as our source. It's never just God time. God's at the center of it all. And now I pull from that because God knows I need it to be a dad. I need it to be a husband. I need it to be a leader. I need it to be a good neighbor. I need it to be sweet to the person who cut me off on my way here, right? I, the anointing of God is not just for the time where we're teaching the Bible or singing a worship song. I need God's anointing to do everyday life. All people matter to God. A fully devoted life to Jesus is normal. It's everything that we do, an overflow of everything we do. If we don't get that, Church, we will create the experience with God as something we do on Sunday or Monday nights when our coworkers and our neighbors desperately need us to be connected and rooted and overflowing from his presence and his source and his spirit. Amen? Amen. Thirdly, excellence honors God. Aristotle says it this way, to be excellent, we cannot simply think or feel excellent. We must act excellently. Excellence is something that we do. And one of the best ways that we do that is how we, we don't operate like the rest of the world. I made this statement on Saturday during our celebration of our volunteers. And I said to the first service, I wasn't sure if I wanted to impart it, but I think it's, in, it's key for me to say this. When we're talking about excellence and how this looks like for the body of Christ, I personally believe that the biggest enemy to the American church is not an outside force. Our biggest enemy is internal division. Every church era, every generation has had its challenges. We're not the first uh, time in history to face a health issue or a pandemic. We're not the first to face uh, economic highs or lows. We're, we're not the first to face an elected official that I voted for or I didn't vote for. We're always going to have those things. Those outside forces are a given. How we respond and how we unite is absolutely key to staying strong together and serving the community. Amen. Amen. In Acts chapter 2, it's the it's the time that we see the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit comes upon the group there. And depending on your background, depending on your persuasion, you might put emphasis on one part of it, but it seems to me that the writer Luke puts a little bit more emphasis on what happens next. Look with me in Acts chapter 2, I'll show you what I mean. Verse number 1, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came and rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from, the, from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't, they all who, uh, aren't all these who are speaking Galatians? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Now give me some grace as I pronounce these challenging words. Parthians and Medes and the Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Potima, yeah, yeah, that one. Judea and, God help me, that place and Pontos and Asia, uh, Phrygia, um, 
Pamphylia, yeah, I need someone else to come up here and read this out loud. Egypt and parts of Lib- uh, Libya near Cyrene, visitors of Rome, certain uh, Cretans and Arabs. We hear declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Now, the emphasis oftentimes is on the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the fact that they were speaking in tongues. And I'm not taking that away. I'm not saying that's not important. But what I think is equally important and certainly worth pointing out here is that the Holy Spirit brought unity from every dialect and tongue and expression. They were floored that this spirit unified them all, even though they came from different areas of the, of the region. This is important. The world is hectic. It doesn't need hectic Christians. This should be a place of peace and refuge. This should be a place where you can belong before you believe anything that we're saying. This should be a place where you're accepted and celebrated because all people matter to God. A fully devoted life to Jesus is normal and Jesus loved everybody and served everybody. And excellence looks like people working in unity even when we don't agree on every point. Amen. So in Acts chapter 2, Peter just gives this message that after that moment, it says 2,000 people are added to the church. Can you imagine today that all at once, 2,000 people from all different walks of life are now part of our local church? And then just a couple of days later in Acts chapter 3, you see another time where 5,000 more people, 8,000 people, it's the first mega church. And the Holy Spirit was doing an amazing thing, bringing people together, unifying, helping, healing, delivering, teaching, discipling. I've discovered this, that if you pray for rain, you got to deal with mud, right? How many know that 3,000 people and 5,000 people coming together, you're going to have a mess on your hands. And I say that because I wasn't prepared for that. I'm embarrassed to admit it, but it's true. I had approximately 10 years of ministry experience that pretty much looked like gathering of other Christians from other churches. I wasn't used to actually communicating a message to people who didn't already know the stuff. And so when people started to come and we were being generous and serving and they were like crazy people, and I'm I'm, mostly because it was making my religious brain go tilt, I learned that part of the responsibility is meeting people where they're at but then the body of Christ serving together. Because how many know one pastor or a couple pastor staff can't serve hundreds or thousands of people to the level they deserve to be served? Amen. Ephesians chapter four, verse number 11, which is the verse that's on the bottom of our church today. And he has appointed some with grace to be apostles and some with the grace to be prophets, some with the grace to be evangelists and some with the grace to be pastors some with the grace to be teachers. And their calling is to nurture and to prepare all the holy believers to do their own works. Say own works. To do your own works of ministry. And as they do this, they will enlarge and build up the body of Christ. So part of the responsibility of a pastor is to help equip those, the saints of God, to find their purpose, their gifting, and their involvement so that we can help build up and disciple and grow the church. Now, I want to just make a a clarity statement here. I'm 100% committed to growing the church. I'm not going to back away from that or be shy about that statement. But I want to be clear on this. It is not just so that we can grow a brand or a bigger building or have something to boast about on how many people attended on the weekends or whatever. No, I'm telling you that, that, and I think I share the heart with the majority of you, that we must be committed to the church growing because the alternative means that they're not hearing this great message that so radically infected and changed our lives. To grow means that we're serving people. We're, we're not just hoarders of this good news, but we're distributors of this good news. And so by not growing, what does that say about us? That we are committed to sharing this amazing, life-altering message. This weekend, my emphasis and my, my ask, if you will, my, I implore you to think about getting involved, to serving and connecting. I think that 
the body of Christ, has, the, the church, has often been described or looks like a hierarchy. And it goes higher and higher, which in some levels it does. But let me, let me do this. Uh, let me illustrate this point. Clint, would you come for me? Becky, would you come? I know how much you love being up here. <laughs> Mona, can you come here? Kind of, would you come up here for a second? Naomi, would you come up here? If you would just make a straight line behind me, as close as you can, and if you're, I'll wait for Naomi. Thank you. If we view the church like this, it could look like this. I might be leading it, but our impact is pretty narrow, right? Because they're all directly behind me. What if we look like the church getting bigger, more like this? If you guys could just join me up here, shoulder to shoulder. What if we look like the body of Christ getting bigger like this, like a river getting wider, going into dry spaces? That every time one person gets involved and they stand next to us and we serve together, not only do we carry the load and the burden together, to make sure that not one person carries it all, but we get wider in this ability to go into the region and the community that God's called us to like a river that brings nourishment and life to everything that it touches. Amen? Amen. Thank you. It's tight up here, I know. Thank you, Becky. Everyone give Becky a hand. (laughs) You're welcome. It's sharing with others what we've received. And then finally, I wrote this statement down. You know, one of the things that um, started this, this T-shirt idea, started this topic, this, this teaching today, was I see where God's taking us as a church. In the coming months, even coming years, the pace is getting faster, and God is adding to us. You know, our church has grown by almost a third over the course of the summer We see approximately five visiting families every weekend that are are hearing about our church, they're visiting. And I say that as as as, as humbly as I can, but do you know how big a deal it is for someone to walk into a church for the first time? It it takes a lot of courage. So I just commend you for doing that. I think it's amazing that you came through and you gave a shot. You gave us a shot that we could serve you. And I really believe this is an authentic church that what you see is what you really get. And, And I see the pace that we're going and this is, this is what alarms me. I'm afraid that I could go this pace for another year or two. And probably some of you who are doing it with me, we could probably do this pace as we stand right now for another year or two. But if we do, I'm afraid that we'll burn out. And I'm afraid that someone might say, hey, I, you remember that church believers? I wonder what happened to them. And I think it could happen if we don't step in now and begin to communicate how much we need one another, that every single person matters. That like Vinny, who, who, who I continue to talk about, and, and one day I'll actually fly him up here so he can actually get a face with, with the impact that he's made. But it's, it's every person making a difference, carrying that burden and that load. And the statement that I wrote down is, please do not even give me or this team permission to burn out. Only you can prevent burnout but helping get involved and serving. I'm gonna invite you to stay and I wanna pray over you. I told myself last service, I was gonna say this in the beginning of the service, but I, I chickened out into this moment and I, I just, so every Sunday morning, I get up hours in, in advance and I'm just spending time with the Lord, going over my notes, thinking about you, praying about the service. And it's not every time, but the Lord spoke something to me today and challenged me to pose this question to you. And it's a bit heavy, I I just wanna warn you, but I say this because I believe God wants us to hear it. The question I believe he asked me to ask you is, if everyone gave or served at the same capacity as you, would the church still remain? And I, I say that not as a condemning thing, I don't believe the Lord brings any type of guilt, shame, or condemnation to our lives. But I think he asks us honest questions. And that means that if we really appreciate what God's doing here, let's, let's make sure it remains. Let's get involved. Let's contribute. Let's trust God together. 
Let's, 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 uh, let's watch this reckless generosity change not only our region, but let's change the state. Let's change the nation. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you so much for a time together in worship, time together around the saints of God and encouraging one another and around your word. Jesus, thank you for being the perfect model of servant and servanthood and serving others when you had all authority, when you, you actually articulated that you had the highest authority, your next move was to remove your garments and wash people's feet. So we know that serving is the door to influence. And God, we want to influence others like you have influenced us. I thank you for the vision that you are birthing even in new hearts today, desires to get involved and to serve and to make a difference today. And Lord, our future really is bright. And I believe that you've called us here on purpose for a purpose. And the stories that are being written are both now and futuristic, and we're excited about it all. I thank you for it. Thank you for each one. In Jesus' name, amen.